Hello and welcome. I'm delighted to be introducing the work from the Academic Health Science Network and the Public Health Genome Foundation on these exciting developments in genomics and personalized medicine. If we get our approach right, the NHS will become the first health system in the world to truly embrace personalized medicine. We'll create a healthcare system focused on improving health, not just treating illness, able to accurately predict disease and tailor treatments with shared decision-making at its heart. This will only be possible to achieve if we continue to work with people across the entire health system. At local levels, with providers, commissioners, patients and the public, and with our national partners, including the Department of Health and Social Care, NHS England and Improvement, Health Education England, Public Health England, NHS Digital and Genomics England. Focusing on the individual patient outcomes results in more effective healthcare and greater precision, increasing the quality of care and decreasing the costs. This report looks at unique ways that the omics era can help define our future healthcare. And I'm thrilled so many eminent scientists and healthcare specialists have contributed to this vital research. Here's just some of the areas the report focuses on. Transcriptomics explores whether changes in gene activity can contribute to the development or progression of disease and there are currently three tests used to inform treatment in some women with breast cancer. More research is needed to explore the potential of transcriptomics and rare disease diagnosis. As further evidence arises for the use of transcriptomics, work will be needed to modify DNA sequencing infrastructure to support investigations into RNA. Research should also focus on standardization of RNA analysis methods so that results are reproducible, accurate and reliable. Circulating tumour DNA testing, or ctDNA, is a fast-moving area of research, with its first application now in clinical practice for treatment selection in non-small cell lung cancer. It is hoped that further tests will be rolled out in other cancers over the next three years, as it shows such promise. Research should be particularly focused on establishing the clinical validity and utility of ctDNA tests. We should seek to determine the most clinically and cost-effective way of using ctDNA testing and develop best practice to support test use. Antimicrobial resistance is one of our greatest global challenges. One area that needs significant acceleration is near patient and point of care rapid testing for infectious disease to support diagnosis and more accurate drug prescribing. Technologies like these support antimicrobial stewardship efforts and have potential to contribute towards global efforts to mitigate antimicrobial resistance. Areas that show particular potential are influenza, urinary tract infections and sepsis. The AHSNs with their existing networks are well placed to support the uptake of testing and can help generate further evidence where needed. They could particularly support further and broader use of point-of-care influenza tests. Industry and academic partners must work closely with the health system to understand health system evidence requirements early in the development process. An area that has seen a significant amount of investment is pharmacogenomics. Current projects are exploring which gene drug pairs are ready for clinical implementation. Once these projects are complete, plans can be progressed for the implementation of pharmacogenomics into the NHS. Much more work is required in many areas, including clinical decision-making systems will need careful development based on the latest evidence to ensure accurate interpretation of invariably complex results. We also need to determine which situations are appropriate for reactive pharmacogenomic testing in response to a particular situation or preemptive testing on healthy people. Underpinning this, collaboration is required to establish the data networks needed to enable correct prescribing. A complex and highly technical area of study is work involving genetically modified regenerative medicines. They are currently being used in certain treatments on the NHS, 
including CAR T's to treat certain blood cancers and a gene therapy used for a rare and severe immunodeficiency disorder called ADA SCID. There is an opportunity to support further innovation in gene therapies and potentially genome editing approaches. However, the challenge is in measuring clinical effectiveness in very small groups of patients with rare diseases. We need to consider how we develop the evidence needed to support the use of these therapies. These are incredibly exciting cutting-edge areas of research. However effective development and implementation relies upon whole health economy engagement. Appropriately with industry, commissioning, education, all these have key roles to play. As we understand in more detail how diseases affect patients differently, new medicines are becoming more targeted. It's more important than ever for us in the biopharmaceutical industry to work closely with clinicians and stakeholders across the NHS to ensure the innovative medicines we develop really address the needs of patients. Although discovery and development of novel medicines is a global undertaking, we want to ensure that UK patients are amongst the first to benefit from these advances. It will be crucial for us to use these new technologies to thoroughly understand the clinical issues that new interventions will address. For example, linking genomics and biomarkers enables us to stratify patients into more specific subgroups. And we're already seeing this, particularly in oncology. Cell and gene therapies offer the promise of long-term benefits and even cures from one-time treatments. We'll need to work closely together with NHS commissioners, especially where new approaches are disruptive and require significant staff training or new delivery pathways, as was the case with the CAR-T therapies. Designing clinical studies to collect the right evidence will be vital to demonstrate the benefits that really matter to patients. And together we'll need to measure the longer term clinical and cost effectiveness that NICE and the NHS will need to support valuation and payment methods. Effective engagement is essential when considering new technologies and how they can benefit patients and clinical services. Informing clinical commissioners about innovations will ensure opportunities for implementation are not missed. Commissioners also need to be kept informed of the specific details and requirements of new technologies in the form of implementation support. And as some of the new innovations require complex infrastructure change to support their use, the implementation support needed will therefore be greater. Also, the NHS digital infrastructure will need to develop in parallel to support the innovations being considered for implementation and if not addressed, will become a barrier to the uptake of certain new evidence-based technologies. Some new technologies can be implemented into care pathways without much disruption. However, others will need change service models to fully deliver their benefits. A coordinated approach will be required to implement these technologies and a concerted effort should be developed to bring about results. Some technologies will only require an additional step in a pathway but it's much more likely that clinical pathway design and changes to referral pathways will be altered as a result of implementation. An example could be when technologies are moved from specialised services and into primary care such as GP surgery testing or monitoring cardiac conditions. However, changing these pathways requires strong leadership and increased resources and should not be underestimated. Preparing the current and future workforce for new technologies and innovation is vital. Our work at Health Education England will continue to embed genomic literacy and competence into the multi-professional workforce at all levels, and we play a key role in workforce planning and workforce transformation. Our genomics education programme has a number of online short and bite-sized courses and even offers a master's framework in genomic medicine. Programmes like these are essential to ensuring that genomic literacy is embedded into clinical practice. They give healthcare professionals the knowledge and confidence to understand the relevance of genomics in their specialism, to understand how genomic data is used in healthcare, and how to communicate the findings from these new technologies to patients. The genomics workforce is diverse and the technologies described in this report are evolving rapidly. We must equip our healthcare scientists and bioinformaticians with the knowledge and skills to safely implement these new technologies, 
and we must ensure the clinical workforce has the capacity and capability to use these new approaches for the diagnosis, management and treatment of their patients. Genomic medicine has a key role to play in providing personalised information that helps patients make informed choices about their treatment. It is important that genomic medicine becomes part of routine practice in primary care as well as secondary care. The HSN network is developing a programme to prevent cardiovascular disease by improving lipid lowering management across the NHS. A key element of this work is to deploy genetic testing in primary care to increase the diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia. This includes developing innovative approaches such as genetic testing for FH in children at their one year immunisation visit. The pandemic has shown that the NHS can change rapidly if there is a strategic imperative and commitment from staff to deliver change. We need to apply that approach and speed to implementing genomic medicine. Patients are partners in all innovation, whether signalling demand, providing advice, helping to redesign pathways or demanding adoption. There are indeed many benefits to patients of implementing these new technologies. For example, we'll be able to identify people most at risk of disease, even before the onset of their symptoms. Earlier detection will open up the prospect of new treatment options and informed lifestyle choices. This can reduce the growing burden of disease, particularly for long-term conditions. While two patients might share the same symptoms, the cause of them could be different. Knowledge of each individual's complex molecular and cellular processes, informed by other clinical and diagnostic information, means that we can fully understand the abnormal function and determine the true cause. Personalised medicine offers the opportunity to move away from trial and error prescribing to optimal therapy first time round. And variants in our genetic code can also be used to predict the potential for adverse drug reactions. This has significant potential to improve the patient experience. Coronavirus has undoubtedly had the biggest impact on the NHS in a generation. The NHS will take some time to get back to normal and we must consider the lessons we have all learned in how we have responded to the pandemic. Which of the new ways of working we keep and which we develop further. Even before the coronavirus, we were facing a challenging time in the NHS with high demand for services from a population with increasingly complex health and care needs. And this demand will only have increased. The NHS must now look at how it can address this demand respond to the new challenges arising from the pandemic and both improve and close the gaps in health outcomes. We know that innovation will be part of this solution. Personalised medicine, with science and innovation at its core, can help make this vision a reality. The potential benefits of personalised medicine are significant and whilst many may consider the changes inevitable, these will only be realised if the NHS systematically embeds these into the care we provide our patients. A crucial part of this approach is the need to meaningfully involve patients and the public to ensure they are confident in the use of these technologies and that we are listening and responding to these views on privacy and equality. The Accelerated Access Collaborative will work with patients and our partners across health, care, government and industry to drive this change. So as you've heard, there's lots to do. I hope you've enjoyed this short introductory video and I would like you to now to download the full report to investigate further. Thank you so much for watching and for all your support in implementing this. Thank you.